don't know. He might have to adjust something over there. I don't know. Is it how, how does it how does it seem to you? Is it too much or is it okay? We can. T I'll test them all to make sure they all work for you. Is it all working? Can you hear? Testing one, two, three. You got it. Okay. Testing one, two, three, you got that one? Testing one, two, three, okay. Testing, testing. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. No.
Hello. Hello. Testing one, two, three. A few more, a few more, a few more. <laughs> All good? Yeah. Okay. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Congressman Lowenthal, and I want to start by thanking my colleagues, but they're not here. But I do want to thank uh, uh, my colleagues and co-chairs of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, and I know he'll be here just in a minute, Congressman McGovern, who is the co-chair, and Congressman Smith, who is the other co-chair. And I want to thank them both for co-hosting this very, very important hearing, and they're sharing that with the Congressional uh, Caucus on Cambodia. I want to say right from the beginning, Congressional Caucus on Cambodia is co-chaired by Congressman uh, Shabbat and myself, and frequently you hear around this institution that Democrats and Republicans can't get anything done and they don't work well together. Well, I will tell you, it is a pleasure, a pleasure to work with Congressman Shabbat. He has demonstrated a, a, an openness and, and, and gives greatly of his time, and we work very well together on this, and agree on, so far, in the last couple of years, on everything that we've done. So I, I just really want to compliment Congressman Shabbat. My district, California's 47th, I believe, now I may be wrong, but we have the largest Cambodian American population in the country. And so this is, whether we're the largest or the second, but I believe we are the, certainly the largest. So this is a very important issue about the um, issue hearing on Cambodia human rights and labor rights. Uh, this is a very important issue to my co constituents. Uh, as we will hear today, the Cambodian government under Prime Minister Hun Sen has been waging a violent war on civil society in Cambodia. Hun Sen's regime has violated international labor standards, it has violated civil rights standards, and it has violated political rights standards. All of these are human rights and they're all linked together, whether we're talking about labor, civil rights, political rights, we're really talking about a conglomerate of, of human rights. Uh, and they're all linked together. Slightly different, but they all are linked together. Legislative tactics that are being used by the regime to crack down on political opposition and dissidents are the same tactics used to crack down on Cambodian unions. For example, in 2016, Hun Sen government passed the trade union law, which governs how unions are formed, how they're operated, and how they're dissolved. Among other things, the law restricts unions' right and union members' rights to organize. It weakens collective bargaining rights, and the right to strike is no longer guaranteed, but is now limited by an elaborate procedural requirements. There are stricter requirements on the registration of unions and strict requirements for prospective union leaders. The law also enacted legal and financial barriers on unions, and it was passed without modifications, which were requested by the country's labor unions. In the last five years, political crackdowns have occurred at the same time as crackdowns on unions. The ruling political party is distrustful of labor unions because it claims that unions are a tool of the opposition party, the CNRP, which has been outlawed by the Cam Cam Cambodian Supreme Court. Therefore, I have introduced the Cambodia Trade Act along with Representative Shabbat in the House and Senator Ted Cruz in the Senate. This bipartisan and bicameral legislation would require the Trump administration to reconsider Cambodia's preferential trade treatment under the general systems of general system of preferences, the GSP, which gives exemptions or reductions to tariffs on goods that Cambodia imports to the United States. Cambodia received this preferential status in 1997, and Cambodia currently exports more than $180 million a year in goods to the US duty-free under this program. The European Union, citing human rights violations by the Hun Sen regime, has also begun a process to suspend their own preferential trading status, which they've granted to Cambodia. 
On February 11th of 2019, the European Commission launched a procedure that could lead to a suspension of Cambodia from EBA trade preferences. In the announcement, the, com the Commission stated, Following a period of enhanced engagement, including a fact-finding mission to Cambodia in July of 2018, and subsequent uh, bilateral meetings at the highest level, the, com the Commission has concluded that there is evidence of serious and systematic violations of core human rights and labor rights in Cambodia, in particular, the rights to political participation, as well as the freedoms of assembly, of expression, and association. These findings add to the longstanding EU concerns about the lack of workers' rights and disputes and, res and dispute resolution, which is linked to economic land concessions in the country. As we know, in 1991, Cambodia signed the Paris Peace Accords, which are also called the Comprehensive Cambodian Peace Agreements, and it promised full multi-party democracy. However, Cambodia under Hun Sen has destroyed democracy as promised by the agreement, and now the U.S. as a signatory of the agreement needs to step up our involvement. Trade and economic growth should not come at the price of democracy and freedom. Hun Sen's regime has violated labor and human rights, as well as undermined the nation's path towards democracy by attempts to abolish any political opposition or dissent. And for that, I believe Cambodia should not enjoy preferential trade privileges with the United States. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today, and I want to see if there are any other members yet. Uh, and uh, before we introduce our panel, I'd like to introduce the uh, co-chair of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, Co-Chair McGovern. Well, thank you very much, and um, I want to thank my colleague, uh, Congressman Lowenthal, for uh, focusing attention on this uh, topic we're discussing here today <coughs> because of him that we're doing this hearing. And I want to say to him thank you and I appreciate his, uh, his dedication. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to submit my opening statement for the record uh, because we may have votes at some point, so I would like to, you know, get right to the testimony. Great. I have been called to the Speaker's office. All right. And I have to leave in a few minutes and I'll come right back. All right. Well, I'm, I'm here. Uh, All right. Thank you. Should we introduce then the panel? I think Congressman Chabot said he'll try to be here by 325. Let's hold him to that. Hold his feet to the fire. Okay, let's let's move on. And uh, if I can find the pages, the statement. Uh, 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 here we go with the witnesses. Let me go through and introduce our witnesses. Our first uh, of our panelists is Tula Muan. I hope that was correct. Uh, 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 Tula is a human rights activist with a particular focus on the labor movement. His organization supports Cambodian laborers by providing them with legal aid and other resources to demand transparent and accountable governance on labor and human rights issues. I'm going to introduce everybody and then ask us to go along, but I'll first introduce and then ask the panelists to speak. Our next panelist is Tiang Pa. Tiang is an independent media and human rights advocate in Cambodia. Welcome to our hearing, our commission. Next, we have Jessica Champagne. No, Daniel Mitchell. Oh, let me go back. Daniel, you do exist, <laughs> but not in the order I have. I will get back to you, Daniel. So let's, ah, here's Daniel. Let's go to Daniel. Daniel Mitchell is an American businessman whose companies in Cambodia are focused on the environmental, sustainable, and socially responsible timber plantations and the processing of timber grown into outdoor furniture. 
He has previously testified before the House Foreign Affairs Committee regarding the business environment in Cambodia, and we look forward to hearing your testimony. Next, we have Jessica Champagne. Jessica is the Director of Research and Advocacy for the Workers' Rights Consortium, an independent labor rights monitoring organization which has a field team in Cambodia. She has coordinated with the Cambodian field team for a number of years and has traveled to Cambodia to meet with civil society leaders and factory workers. Next, we have back again Olivia Enos, who's a policy analyst at the Heritage Foundation. Welcome back. She specializes in human rights and transnational criminal issues. She has written extensively about the deterioration of democracy and civil society in Cambodia. And finally, we have John Sifton, who is the uh, Asia Advocacy Director at Human Rights Watch. He regularly travels to Cambodia to work with the Human Rights, Watch, Human Rights Watch's research team and meeting with, and goes there to meet with right, human rights advocates and policymakers and diplomats. And a frequent visitor to this commission. And so. a frequent visitor. <laughs> to, and I just have to apologize. I'm going to have to run out. The speaker has asked me to come to a meeting right now in her office. And then she said I can come right back to the hearing right after. Okay. So with that, uh, welcome. And let's go with Tula. Would you like to begin with your presentation? I think we'll have... Uh, what, five minutes on each to, up to, to make a presentation, and then we'll kind of, I hope to be back by then and make, ask some questions to all. Okay, sure. thank you. Okay. Let's go. Thank you. Welcome. Firstly, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the Tom Lentos Human Rights Commissions for giving me this opportunity to testify. Sorry? Is your mic on? Oh, yeah. I put on already. Yeah, closer. closer. Yeah. Thank you. It is my second testimony before the Commission. The first one was in 2009. Unfortunately, many of the issues remain problems today, highlighting the lack of progress on labor rights in Cambodia. When I testified in 2009, the minimum wage in the government sector and foodware was 50 US dollars per month. Ten years later, in, it increased up to 182 per month. Uh, while this signifies the increase, it is too low to the adequately covered living costs in Cambodia. A light measures Interview workers inform us that uh, 300 to 350 per month would cover their basic need to survive. This means that the current minimum wage in the government sector and foodware sectors is not nearly adequate level. To make end meet, workers are effectively forced to work overtime to talk up <coughs> to stock up their income, which can result in 60 hour work per day or and six day per week. Low wage is also have direct effect on the workers' ability to exercise their freedom of, uh, of association and organize themselves into the independent trade union. Workers have brave enough, break, worker are brave enough to form and stand up as a leader of the independent unions. Routinely have their employment terminated for doing so. As wage are far below what is constituted to sustain a basic uh, living, workers effectively live on hand to mouth and scared to take on the risk to come with the union participation. Freedom of association is also significantly restricted through the widespread use of short-term contracts in Cambodia. The impact of short-term contracts on labor rights was also a, the issue that I was, speaking, uh, I was speaking during my previous testimony in 2009. Since that time, short-term contract usage still remain widespread in Cambodia, with many employers violating the maximum period pre prescribed in the labor law, engaging workers for fixed duration contract. In May, in May of this year, the Ministry of Labor and Vocational Training issued a new guideline regarding fixed duration contracts. This guideline undermined the consistent arbitration council interpretation article 67 of the labor law, which prevent employer from employer employing workers for fixed term contract after two years of employment. Under the new guideline, which have less leg legal force than the labor law, an employer could theoretically engage a worker on a successive fixed term contract for the maximum of four years. Worker employed on this contract have no sense at all for the job security and exercise the non-renewal of 
experience in non-renewal of their contract for reasons including uh, union participation, pregnancies, and so on. As such, extending the period of time in which workers can be engaged on this, uh, this short-term contract is absolutely detrimental to labor rights and fundamental freedom in Cambodia. We have seen this already in case worker employed in the short-term contract who dare to stand as a leader of independent union. For example, one <coughs> at one factory which supplies clothing uh, brand in the text and bestseller, short-term contract of seven workers were not renewed uh, their contract less than a month after forming an independent union in the factory. While termination of a union leader without ministry, of, uh, ministry approval uh, is illegal under the law on trade union, in this case, ministry just took the view that non-renewal of the union uh, leader uh, employment contract did not violate the law. As such, this terminated leader have not been reinstated and the factory no longer has the independent trade union. Disappointingly, both bestseller and Intex had to to acknowledge the contract non-renewal of what they were, employment decision made on the basics of workers' exercise, of union activity, and therefore illegal under the Article uh, 12 of the Labor Law. This form of discrimination against independent union is uh, rampant in Cambodia. Independent unions are routinely targeted by employer in aggressive union busting tactics involving bribe, termination, and even criminal complaint. Meanwhile, the government control and management aligned union are free to operate independently uh, and impedly, with their leader regularly provided <coughs> financial support and others incentive to in the exchange for remaining silent on the issues of workers. For example, at another factory supplying to Inditex, four independent union leaders were terminated after forming a union in the factory. Upon the complaint being raised to the brand sourcing from the factory, the management claimed that they were preparing uh, to reinstate the workers, but another union in the factory threatened to conduct the strike action if uh, those workers were reinstated. In the reality, this union was a management-aligned union and was protesting reinstatement of the independent union leaders that the behest of the factory management. These workers are yet to be reinstated, and consequently, there is no longer an independent union present in the, the factory. I would like to close by stressing that the issues I have raised here today do not even begin to touch the surface of the continuing deterioration of labor rights and the freedom in Cambodia. Some of these other issues, such as the impact on the law on trade unions, uh, on unions' ability to freely operate workplace violence, raising the production target, which will expand it upon in my written submission to the Commission, along with my recommendation for the action to improve the labor rights in, in Cambodia. We are very concerned about continuing harassment against independent union leaders, workers in response to their strike and union activity, and with many cases are still pending. Once again, I would like to sincerely thank the Commission for giving me this opportunity to testify today, and I remain at your disposal for any further information needed to make assessment on your situation on Cambodia. Thank you very much, and we've been joined by Congressman Chabot. I'd like to yield him uh, whatever time he needs. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Um, as the co-chair of the Congressional Cambodia Caucus, along with uh, Congressman Lowenthal, uh, I'm glad that we have the opportunity to host this hearing today with the Tom Lantos uh, Human Rights Commission. Unfortunately, political and labor rights are in short <laughs> supply in Cambodia, and over the past few years, Prime Minister Hun Sen has cracked down further on his political opponents in a bid to retain power. It became clear over the past several years that if he let democracy run its course, he would have lost his position as prime minister. And so he decided to pull the plug on democracy, show that the charade was up, and demonstrate who was really in charge of the country, him, not the Cambodian people. To do so, Hun Sen manufactured a story out of whole cloth that the United States had conspired with the CNRP to have a coup against his government. Uh, I have news for Hun Sen, elections are not coups. He then proceeded to outlaw the CNRP, ban its members from holding office, and detain Kamsoka, 
who remains illegally under house arrest today in contravention of Cambodian law. He also forced the National Democratic Institute and RFA to close, and he shuttered independent radio stations that carried the Voice of America and RFA programming. And these are just the highlights, lowlights, really. The list goes on. No wonder Hun Sen's party won all the seats in this summer's parliamentary election, an election that was neither free nor fair. Actions ought to have consequences. And this is why Mr. Yoho, joined by several other members, including myself, have pushed forward the Cambodian Democracy Act, which would sanction members of the Cambodian government who are responsible for uprooting democracy. This is also why Congressman Lowenthal and I introduced the Cambodia Trade Act, which would require a review of the GSP trade privileges we extend to Cambodia. GSP is a benefit that the American people extend to developing countries. But it comes with strings attached, and one of these strings is the protection of labor rights. Not surprisingly, Hun Sen hasn't protected these either. In my opinion, it's time that we stop playing his game and move forward with these two measures. I'm told that Cambodia would like better relations with the United States. That's excellent, because we would like better relations with Cambodia, too. But let me clearly state that Cambodia, not the United States, is responsible for the downturn in relations, and so Cambodia must fix the problem, namely by ceasing to persecute the opposition and allowing free and fair elections. If Hun Sen really wants better relations, he should act like it. Thank you for your Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we're doing this hearing because Mr. Lowenthal asked, but also because of Mr. Chabot. So we appreciate your statement and your leadership. Thank you. Uh, we now go to uh, T. Yang Pa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Congressman. Uh, following the first oppression on media NGO union and the shutdown of the NLP late 2017, Hun Sen government seemed not to step back, but is increasingly it cracked down. Media, NGO, union, and other activists are working under close surveillance and serious threat by the government, which has done so by putting all state mechanisms, particularly the three state power, legislation, judiciary, and executive, in one line, in one line for one goal to turn Cambodia into an absolute totalitarian state. For instance, the parliament can make or amend laws and cons constitution for such purpose. The courts can adjust the cases or legal interpretation uh, to meet the need of the executive, and the executive can make up allegations, even groundless, to arrest human rights and political activists. For, for example, last month, a young female environmental activists were arrested and she was intimidated and may I issue, may I issue, so, so this is an unusual request but um, this is a personal regret uh, I have a um, uh, we, my, uh, my, my dad just had surgery and the doctor's on the phone so I need to talk to him briefly so I will come right back to you but I, I promise it won't be long okay uh.
Charles Hatton for me. Um, I am I am sorry, but good news, you know, he survived his open heart surgery, so that's, that's we're all happy about that. So, <laughs> um, anyway, I'm sorry to have interrupted your your testimony. So you may continue. Thank you, Chairman. So I would like to start from the beginning. Okay. okay. Right. Following the first oppression on May and Yo Union and the shutdown of CNOP in late 2017, Hosan government seemed not step back but is increasing its crackdown. Media, NGO, union, and other activists are working under close surveillance and serious threat by the government, which has done so by putting all state mechanisms, particularly the three state power, legislation, judiciary, and executive in one line for one goal to turn Cambodia into absolute totalitarian state. For instance, the parliament can make or amend laws and constitution for such purpose. The courts can adjust the case or legal interpretation to meet the need of the executive, and the executive can make up allegations, even groundless, to arrest human rights and political activists. Last month, a young female environmental activist was arrested, and she was intimidated and interrogated concerning her personal Facebook, personal Facebook post for many hours at the local police precinct from the morning until midnight before she was released. It should be noted that her personal Facebook was hacked a few days before the arrest, and as then she publicly denied all contents posted on in the page, including the fake news Hun Sen was dead. In fact, the fake news posted on her post personal Facebook was made up as an excuse for the arrest, and the true cause of the arrest was her controversial activism. <laughs> by, the end, by the end of August this year, according to Ligado, 19 CNOP activists were, were arrested, and other 156 are under judicial and authority harassment. This figure doesn't include those who are arrested and under court summon this month, while their president comes car is under house arrest, and more than 100 leaders has been banned from politics. From April 2018 to March 2019, CCR recorded 
825 incidents that were the activity of the government authority involved in the restriction that did not comply with international human rights standards enshrined in Cambodian laws and constitution. Such restrictions were made in the forms of excessive supervision and un interference of the government. For instance, police surprisingly enter an NGO private meeting room in Phnom Penh while that NGO was conducting mit monthly meeting. Similarly, such incidents were also experienced by other NGO, NGOs throughout the country as they were complicatedly checked and questioned or even stopped by local authority while conducting routine activities, including the training of farmers on feeding chickens. Similarly, my organization, CCM, released a media study report early 2018 and found out that in addition to physically and verbally attacks, ongoing government interference has led many journalists to believe that the authority look for excuses to persecute them, photograph them, and deny them access to National Assembly and other venues. A freedom of assembly were continuously deteriorated in the last period of this year among other troubles, it is noted that at the peaceful march for women rights in March were blocks. Peaceful gathering of the third year memorial to the assassinated Dr. Kamley in July were violently dispersed and two youths are still in prison. And the announced plan for peaceful protest for the release of Kamsaka by a teacher association last month was banned. Ironically, Cambodia made laws with vague provision and with clear intention that can subject to arbitrary interpretation by judicial authority and restriction on freedom of expression. Following the adoption of the law on telecommunication in December 2015, which grant the state broad authority to monitor public and private communication, since January 2018, the government has inducted several pieces of legislation, regulation, and policy that has placed additional excessive restriction on free speech and media freedom. For instance, amendments to Article 42 and 49 of the Constitution enacted in February 2018 require political parties and Khmer citizens to refrain from conducting any activity which either directly or indirectly affect the interests of the kingdom and also of Khmer people. In addition to the power concentration by tactics, action, and law about, Hun Sen regime has also strengthened power by corruption in collusion with some investors who have hijacked the advantage of company development partnership opportunities such as what is not limited to is not limited to EU, EBA, and US GSP. To help restore the respect for human rights and democracy in Cambodia, I do recommend the United States and other international community partners to consider task action against individuals, institutions, including private sector who are involved in action or support for human rights violation and democracy destruction in Cambodia. Last but not least, I would like to take this opportunity I, uh, to congratulate and thank to the U.S. House of Representatives for the passage of the Bill of 526, and also my special thank to Congressman Alain Lovantol and Congressman Steve Chabot, co-chair of the Con Congressional Cambodia Caucus, who sponsored the bill. I also wish to see the bill will be considered and passed by the Senate. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mitchell. Welcome. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the members of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission and the other people who made this hearing possible. I am honored to have an opportunity to testify here today. My name is Daniel Mitchell. I'm an, I lead two American companies in Cambodia. I'm an entrepreneur and a business strategist. I have nearly two decades of experience in Cambodia. 
I am an unusual person to testify before a Human Rights Commission. I am not an activist for de democracy or human rights. I'm not a labor advocate. I'm not here in the support of CNRP or any other political party. But like all business leaders, I am a proponent of rule of law because without that foundation, democracy, human rights, and business will wither and die. Today, I bring firsthand experience of the de deterioration of rule of law in Cambodia and its impact. In April 2018, six of our employees were extrajudicially arrested by the gendarmerie. This is a paramilitary police organization. There was no arrest warrant. There was no legal writ. The actions did not even provide the facade of due process or rule of law. The purpose of the arrest was to allow powerful and wealthy people to seize the timber planted and owned by our company on land leased for 70 years beginning in 2002. Unfortunately, this reflects a disturbing trend in Cambodia, especially involving land. In the environment created by the Cambodian government, a wealthy elite who are members of or have close ties to the government or military act with impunity. That elite is now endangering the growth engine of the Cambodian economy. It's manufacturing exports to the United States and the European Union. Prime Minister Hun Sen and the CPP have led, the, led Cambodia through a significant period of achievement. It has been a period of relative peace and strong economic growth, but they have not done it alone. Trade with the United States and the European Union have been a critical component. Today, we need to ask ourselves, are we providing the economic growth which allows the CPP to leverage increase in autocracy? Today, one cannot, cannot discuss Cambodia without considering China's influence. There are whisper whispers that the U.S. and China are in the early stages of a new Cold War. My opinion is we are, and Cambodia is one of the front lines. In few places in the world are the philosophies and the policies of the U.S. and China in, soft, in sharper contrast. Human rights and labor rights are at the forefront of these differences. China is focused on investment and financial aid in Cambodia. In 2017, only 3.4% of Cambodia's exports went to China, and most of that was agricultural products. Aid from China comes with minimal control or accountability, but, does, but not without strings, and those strings have included support of China's position in the South China Sea. Now there are credible reports of Chinese military establishments under construction in Cambodia. Its investments in casinos have effectively turned the port city of Sihanoukville into a Chinese colony, causing tremendous social and environmental problems. The Chinese investments in, con in the construction sector have had tragic consequences for Cambodian workers. In contrast, the United States and the European Union have assisted Cambodia in rebuilding its economy through trade, providing economic incentives to pursue responsible labor, uh, labor policies. In 1997 and uh, 1999, a bilateral agreement granted Cambodia greater access to the U.S. market in exchange for improved labor rights and working conditions. Upon that foundation, Cambodia built its garment industry. In 2001, the EU began to allow everything but arms to be imported duty-free, leading Cambodia to be a leading bicycle supplier to Europe. In 2016, the United States granted tariff-free import of travel goods under the GSP pro preferences program. Because of labor productivity issues, high energy costs, high logistics costs, informal payments, and outright corruption, Cambodia needs tariff-free access for its products to be globally competitive. These programs have attracted responsible foreign investment in export manufacturing industries employing over 2 million people today, 22% of Cambodia's workforce. Of the $13.2 million billion of exports in 2018, 3.8, 29%, went to the United States. 5.8 billion, 41%, went to the EU. Without the increase and growth provided by the U.S. travel goods sector, Cambodia's exports would have declined by 2% instead of growing by 4% in 2018. These programs are now at risk because of the actions of the Cambodian government. Earlier this year, because of the extrajudicial arrest, our company filed a petition 
with USTR requesting the termination of Cambodia's status as a beneficiary country under GSP. As part of our ongoing dialogue with USTR, we voluntarily withdrew the petition in hopes of resolution through other means. Little progress has been made and we will likely refile at our next uh, window of opportunity. The House Bill, Cambodian Trade Act of 2019, seeks the same review of Cambodia's GSP status and a similar bill in, in the Senate. The European Union EBA program is also currently under review. By my estimates, half of Cambodia's exports are at risk. Kem Sukha is accused of treason for receiving assistance from the U.S. and other countries. I don't know if this is true. Little evidence has been presented. But I do know the employment and economic growth that these trade programs have provided the current government are a far, far greater source of foreign assistance in staying in power. In conclusion, two respected Harvard political scientists, Samuel P. Huntington and Francis Fukuyama, have put forth a thesis in their writing that developing countries may need a period of strongman rule, rule on the road to sustainable democracy. This period is, is to allow the necessary development of government institutions. Up until 2017, I believe Cambodia was on such a roll. But when the strong men begin to stifle basic rule of law, it becomes the road to depotism. It is time for Cambodia to demonstrate action in good faith that they want to make the necessary improvements. Thank you very much, Ms. Champagne. Thank you um, to each of the representatives and to the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission and the Congressional Cambodia Caucus for providing us with this opportunity to highlight the challenges that are facing workers in Cambodia. Our team at the Worker Rights Consortium conducts independent investigations into workers' rights around the world with a focus on the garment industry. What we've seen in Cambodia is that respect for freedom of association has deteriorated significantly in recent years. Workers often contact us after they've attempted to resolve workplace problems but have been met with threats, terminations, intimidation, and even their employers filing criminal charges against them. The lack of protections and respect for workers' rights to form and participate independent unions means that uh, workers have little recourse when they experience pregnancy discrimination, wage theft, and other violations of their rights. We're, uh, we've identified three key obstacles to discuss today of camp that um, stand in the way of Cambodian workers exercising their associational rights. The first is the 2016 trade union law, uh, which Congressman Lowenthal referenced. The second is the use of short-term contracts. And the final one is the use of false criminal charges to harass and intimidate advocates and unionists. First, the trade union law. Uh, prior to 2016, although workers did face repression, sometimes including physical violence, they were largely able to, um, on occasion, form independent unions and win improvements on the job. The 2016 trade union law, however, created significant roadblocks for workers attempting to exercise their associational rights. The most important of these was that the law significantly restricted the abilities of unions that do not have most representative status, or MRS, to represent their members in official proceedings. In a context in which employers use all available means, including the formation of employer-dominated yellow unions, as well as threats, financial inducements, and retaliation, to prevent workers from being able to build independent unions. This means that many workers experience retaliation for trying to form a union, and then when they try to seek redress, they're not allowed to seek that union support in defending their rights. This is exacerbated by onerous union registration requirements and the government's practice of arbitrarily denying union registrations for trivial reasons such as clerical errors. The draft revisions to the trade union law that the government has recently circulated do not adequately address several of the core issues with the law, including MRS. There are internal contradictions in that draft which would move Cambodia backwards instead of forward in terms of the rights of workers trying to form independent unions. Second is short-term contracts, which Tola also discussed. For more than a decade, Cambodia's garment industry has chosen to employ the majority of its workforce on short-term contracts or fixed-duration contracts as they're known locally. The widespread use of these FDCs prevents, presents significant challenges to addressing violations of basic rights. More than two-thirds of factories producing for export are illegally maintaining workers on short-term contracts for longer periods than are allowed by the law. While most U.S. apparel companies have adopted voluntary codes of conduct 
that require compliance with the law, they've taken little action to prevent the use of these illegal contracts by their suppliers. And uh, this is an area where international companies' actions can have an immediate impact. At one factory supplying H&M and Gap, among others, the Cambodian Arbitration Council found that more than 400 workers were being illegally denied permanent contracts. After the WRC engaged the buyers, the factory began for the first time to bring those contracts in line with the law. And we would state that it is time for more U.S. apparel firms to step up and require that their suppliers end this illegal practice. Finally, baseless criminal charges. The Cambodian government has repeatedly misused its judicial system as a means to threaten and harass human rights defenders, including union leaders and worker rights advocates. And the first two gentlemen who testified today have personal experience of that experience of um, baseless charges, baseless uh, threats of detention. The Cambodian unions have identified more than 100 of these criminal charges that are currently pending against workers and union leaders. And those charges serve as a tool for the government not only to intimidate and attempt to silence those specific leaders, but to create a broader chilling effect on the country's entire labor relations climate. So both the U.S. government and the U.S. companies that are producing apparel, travel goods, and other products in Cambodia have a key opportunity to press the Cambodian government to change its approach. Over the past several years, when major apparel brands and industry associations have made clear the importance of key labor issues, the government has shown willingness to shift its position on certain issues. And so we would encourage both the U.S. government and U.S. brands doing business in Cambodia to encourage the Cambodian government to reform the trade union law and other Cambodian labor regulations such that they are in line with core ILO conventions, to end the abuse of short-term contracts, and to end the misuse of the judicial system to retaliate against human rights defenders, including trade unionists. Specifically, we would suggest that this commission request the, to the U.S. Trade Representative that USTR engage further with the Cambodian government regarding the need to fully respect freedom of association, and in particular to um, address the three issues I've discussed. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Enos. Cambodia's democracy is in shambles. 2018 elections solidified Cambodia's descent into one-party rule, the outcome of the elections widely known before 2018 even began. The country's leader, Prime Minister Hun Sen, has systematically driven any hope of democratic transformation in Cambodia into the ground with little to no regard for the impact it would have on the Cambodian people. Rather than provide an outline of Cambodia's turn from democracy, the arrest and detention of Kem Sokha, the dissolution of the opposition, and sham 2018 elections, I would like to spend the remainder of my testimony making the case for why the U.S. should hold Cambodia accountable and lay out next steps to encourage political reform and respect for human rights. U.S. strategists often set up a false dichotomy when observing Cambodia that forces U.S. policymakers to choose between promoting human rights and democracy and achieving strategic national security priorities in the country. But there is no need to choose. Why is this the case? First, promoting human rights and values in Cambodia advances core components of U.S. strategy in Asia. When the Trump administration inaugurated the Indo-Pacific strategy, it did not just commit to increasing engagement with partners and allies in Asia on security and economic challenges, it committed to promoting values. The inclusion of values in the Indo-Pacific strategy demonstrated foresight. Presumably, the reason why values are included in the strategy is because U.S. policymakers believe that U.S. interests are best advanced when values are promoted. A failure to address political realities in Cambodia contradicts that strategy and undermines U.S. ability to advance its foreign policy priorities in the region. Second, U.S. promotion of values in Asia contrasts with China. The primary objection to promoting values and defending democracy in Cambodia is the fear that U.S. criticism of Cambodia on human rights grounds may force Cambodia further into China's orbit. <coughs> This argument is perhaps strengthened when we look at recent events in Cambodia where reports suggest that Cambodia may be leasing a naval port to China. Cambodia's efforts to cozy up to China cannot be overlooked in crafting U.S. strategy, but that does not automatically mean capitulating on the promotion of human rights. Countries in Southeast Asia do not like to be asked to choose between engaging with China or the U.S., the reality, in fact, is that all countries in the region will engage, especially economically, with both countries. However, some in Southeast Asia may be persuaded that China is not a suitable long-term partner on political and security matters. Firstly, because China's engagement in Southeast Asia is hardly altruistic. 
Much of China's engagement in the region has been through China's amorphous Belt and Ro Road Initiative. Rather than hiring local workers for infrastructure projects from the various Southeast Asian nations, the Chinese state-owned enterprises have brought their own Chinese workers. This has bred resentment among Cambodians who, rightly or wrongly, fear that their country is being taken over by China. Second, China has been known in the past to covertly, and in some cases overtly, deploy surveillance technology in its investment projects. In some cases, it is deployed to assist other governments in efforts to spy on their own citizens, as in the case of Ecuador and Zimbabwe. In other situations, it is deployed for the purpose of spying on various governments for espionage and information collecting purposes. In 2018, for example, the African Union levied accusations that the Chinese government hacked into computer systems in the African Union headquarters in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Beijing footed the $200 million bill for the development of AU headquarters, which were built by Chinese SOEs. The Chinese government allegedly lined the walls with microphones and rigged the system so that they received downloads from African Union servers nightly between 2012 and 2017. While these efforts so far took place outside of the region, it is nonetheless a warning sign of what could happen in places like Cambodia if they accept Chinese investment without forethought or caveats. Third, advancing human rights in Cambodia breeds goodwill among the Cambodian people. While the Cambodian government's actions in recent months trend toward China, overwhelmingly, the Cambodian people remain supportive of the US in large part because the U.S. has advocated for their human rights even when their own government has not. This is goodwill that the U.S. should do all in its power to maintain. The Cambodian people as independent agents of change are the most likely engines of future democratic reforms. It is important that the U.S. institute policies that create space for civil society and the voices of the Cambodian people to be heard. Given how dire the situation is in Cambodia, there is a strong need for the U.S. to develop a swift, thorough and strategic response to political upheaval there. The US should, among other steps, which are outlined in my full statement submitted for the record, first, commit to advancing human rights and values in the Indo-Pacific strategy. Second, create and convene an emergency meeting of the Cambodia Contact Group, comprised of parties to the 1991 Paris Peace Agreement, including perhaps Australia, France, Indonesia, Japan, the United Kingdom, and the United States, to monitor and press for democratic reform. Third, name and sanction Hun Sen and other Cambodia People's Party's cadres for the role that they've played in undermining democracy in Cambodia, including by extend, expanding existing visa restrictions on Cambodian officials undermining democracy. Fourth, condition assistance to Cambodia on the health of democracy. And fifth, continue to press for the full release of Khem Sokha. The U.S. should do all that it can to support actors in Cambodia that will fight for the civil liberties and fundamental freedoms of average Cambodians. They alone form the sole basis for hope that human rights will be respected in Cambodia once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, last but not least, Mr. Sifton, um, you probably heard the bells go off as a series of votes, so we're going uh, to get you in, though, before we go to vote. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to testify, and I'm in agreement with many of the recommendations made by my co-panelists. Um, the other panelists have thoroughly reviewed the deteriorating situation, and I don't want my testimony to be redundant, so I'd ask the written record of my testimony be entered into the record. Without objection. Uh, my organization, HRW, has also posted a copy of my testimony on our website, hrw.org. I just want to emphasize the overarching point of my testimony, the fact that the work of pressing for human rights improvements in Cambodia has um, gone on for decades, and it really now has reached an impasse. And so it's time for governments like the United States to adopt new approaches. Um, and let's be clear about what's been going on for the last 27 years or so. Cambodia's ruling party, the CPP, has for decades been attempting to present itself behind this veneer of democratic legitimacy. And that's the product of these several deeply flawed elections that took place in 1993, 1997, 19, 2003, all of which were marked by violence and corruption and vote fraud and other abuses. And so now, in power since 1985, and then they continue to wield the power like they always have, but now they've gone into a new area where they've essentially thrown off the veneer of democratic legitimacy and have started acting like a de facto one-party state. 
Um, the CPP now maintains complete control over all ministries, security forces, the courts, the National Assembly, um, and that has made it so much easier in recent years for the government not to use just outright violence, but use uh, the laws of the country, such as they are, and the courts, which are merely extensions of uh, the CPP, to go after labor rights activists and human rights activists and media and just shut them down using the legal process. And I list the examples of that in my written testimony, the destruction of the political opposition, the crackdown on civil society, media, labor rights. The details are all in my written testimony. Um, on labor rights, I just want to emphasize the political crackdown has led to a worsening situation, both because they've been cracking down on labor rights, but also because the generalized intimidation and climate of fear because of the uh, crackdown on political actors means that labor rights activists also are in a state of intimidation and fear. I also want to emphasize that the crackdown on civil and political rights is connected to abuses of economic rights. And the government continues to allow you know, major land concessions and all these development projects that have been listed which affect people um, in such horrible ways. Few people can stand up for their rights uh, when they're displaced from their land. And far from lifting up its citizens, most of these economic development projects often make people uh, in worse situation than they began. So look, the point of my testimony is to say Governments now need to turn a new page in their approach to Cambodia. And the United States in particular needs to adopt uh, tougher and more punitive measures and recognize that the severity uh, now of the human rights situation requires this. The Cambodian government has given countless, uh, has been given countless opportunities to relax its grip on power in exchange for closer ties with the United States, but the time for that type of transactional quiet diplomacy is over. To motivate behavioral change, the CPP needs to be shown that there is a price for their bad behavior. And that's why we agree with many of our co-panelists that it's time for the United States and other go governments to impose targeted sanctions on CPP leadership. And there's been a lot of talk about GSB and what the Europeans are doing with that. And, I, and that is something we can discuss, especially in Q&A if possible. But we feel that really to behave to get behavioral change in the CPP government, you need to impose not just travel restrictions on CPP leaders, but begin listing additional leaders of the Cambodian security services who are implicated in gross human rights abuses. List them on the Treasury Department's specially designated nationals list under the Global Magnitsky Law, which allows uh, sanctions and economic sanctions on people implicated in gross human rights abuses. A comprehensive set of sanctions, not just one or two of the worst uh, abusers, but a large number of the CPP's leadership. This will get the government's attention and lead to behavioral change. That's what the U.S. government needs to do. What does the U.S. Congress need to do? Well, basically lobby the Treasury Department and the State Department to do that. Uh, the legislation that's been discussed would, would, would go a long way towards doing that, but the real uh, work of just pushing the State Department to use its existing authorities under Global Magnitsky and Economic Powers Act to sanction the government is really what we would ask of members of Congress today. As for the issue of tariff preferences, I mean, I don't want to overthink it. HR, Human Rights Watch doesn't want to overthink this. Uh, we're in complete agreement that a review of GSP is appropriate. And in fact, I would say that any country which is a recipient of tariff preferences under the GSP program should have its uh, preferences reviewed on a periodic basis. So I don't think we have to really you know, overthink this. We, we're in complete agreement that a review is in order, especially because of the labor rights abuses that I've listed in my written testimony and other members have listed in theirs. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you again for allowing me to testify. And hope well, you thank you for your excellent questions. testimony. Thank you all for your excellent testimony. This has been, uh, I think it's been very impor important hearing so far. Um, we, we're going to have to go uh, vote, but before I do, I want to yield to uh, my colleague from Texas, uh, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and thank you for your leadership. And I can never come to these hearings uh, when I do not uh, refer to the late Tom Lantos, who um, helped guide both of us, but more importantly, um, the naming of this commission after him is hopefully a statement that you take comfort in. Um, we're reminded of Cambodia's history, and I've heard most of the witnesses, and 
So let me say that I join uh, in your request uh, for action by both the United States Congress and our State Department. Clearly you are uh, relaying and detailing uh, the behavior of both government and business and others that really uh, penalizes the, the people. It is punitive uh, in, its, uh, in its leadership. And uh, the government of Hung Sing uh, should uh, really pay the price for, one, the oppression of uh, environmental activists. Uh, now I understand the uh, continuing of logging uh, into uh, the uh, natural resources uh, for uh, products that are sold to China and Thailand, among others, uh, which also, uh, by the oppression of labor unions, uh, creates uh, just an atmosphere where democracy is not in the forefront, but it's in the back. So uh, I would indicate to you that uh, your commentary about what conditions people are living in and how we in the United States may be contributing by our own policies, uh, if not directly, then indirectly, uh, is something that I know the Commission will take concern with. And you know there's legislation uh, dealing with the preferred trade status, and I know that maybe some of you might have mentioned that. I'm certainly uh, outraged about the human trafficking element uh, that may be growing, um, impacting uh, the youngest of this uh, nation. So my words to you are that the uh, words that you've offered have not fallen on deaf ears. Um, I thank Human Rights Watch for the attentiveness and all of the organizations from the Heritage Society and, and all uh, for your firsthand knowledge, for your firsthand knowledge, uh, and our commitment uh, to raise this, to bring attention to it, uh, and to find a way for Cambodia to know uh, that as an early friend uh, post uh, the Cambodian War of many, many years ago, that that was not what that violent uh, and brutal time was for. It was to give the people peace, give them democracy, give them the ability to flourish, uh, and some of the elements of taking land um, and uh, punishing people and uh, using the power of government and business uh, to demean the very essence of individuals' souls uh, is not acceptable. And hopefully with the commission uh, and legislation that we know is proceeding, uh, work that is done, uh, that we can proceed and act accordingly uh, to make a, an important statement to Cambodia. Thank you very much. I apologize. We have a series of votes, so we're going to take a recess, um, and um, and we will be back as soon as we possibly can. So the committee stands adjourned until we and the recess until votes are over. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. <laughs>
to being here the entire time. We had set it up. We actually, if you remember, moved it back till three o'clock so we could all, and then the speaker had a special meeting that we had on a, that I, you know, when the speaker calls, you gotta go. So I had, so I was summoned to her office and in a positive way, but, and then we voted on the floor and I just really appreciate everyone being here and testimony. Buying and so if you have a few more minutes, what I'd like to do is, uh, you know, I did miss a lot of, uh, you know, I know you all presented and I did miss a lot of the uh, uh, actual presentation. Uh, I want to thank my colleagues for helping out while I was gone, but I have some questions. I know that, I think we had talked to Daniel before about the trade bill that we're doing, I, he, you, you had come and visited and we had talked about it. But you know, I have special interests myself. I'm, as you all know, I have real concerns about what's going on in Cambodia in terms of, and so I was the author along with uh, Mr. Shabbat who has the same concerns that I do about democracy and the loss of human rights. And, and so we put forward and then we're working with, and are working with uh, uh, Senator Cruz in, in the Senate. So my question to you is, and I don't know where it's gonna go, it's, you know, it's, it's tough doing sanctions bills and it's tough doing lifting trade benefits when, you know, we put this on when Cambodia was emerging more towards a democratic state and then, and we really wanted to support the Cambodian and we thought by having these trade benefits it would help, but obviously Cambodia has decided to move, or the leadership anyway, in a different direction. And so I, my question to you, do you think it's really important, you know, you're the kind of experts on the ground, do you think it's really important that the United States and the EU uh, examine Cambodia's trade privileges now? What do you think? Let's go across and just give me an answer. If you don't want to answer, that's fine too. You know, if you feel like that's not what you, I'm not, but I'm just, you know, as, as the person who is kind of invested in it, I'd love to hear from people who are experts on Cambodia. What do you think? Do you think it's important that the Senate and the, ha and the House really look at the, the privileges that we've given Cambodia when Cambodia was beginning to develop and, you know, after the, in the 1990s and, uh, and has begun to develop but now we're really worried about it's moving in the right direction or the wrong direction. So what do you think? You think we're moving, we should be doing this with the EU and moving towards at least examining those trade privileges and, and having a, a, a real study on them? What do you, let's, anybody wanna answer that? Tula? Uh, or Daniel, why don't you start? Then? I also have a vested interest in this because we have we have had an infraction that comes at this same issue from a different angle, where the bill looks at this from a human rights and a labor rights standpoint. Right. Ours is a direct violation of chapter and verse in the uh, 1974 criteria for beneficiary countries. The problem I see in Cambodia is it's being taken for granted. There's, there's no <laughs> obligation to meet the other requirements and things such as the situation where we had six people extrajudicially arrested as a US company. Okay, these things happen, but there has been in 17 months no effort to correct it. And senior ministries have been made aware of it to include the Minister of Commerce and his response was, well, it's not his area. Well, if it's not his area, whose area is it? On the USTR side, because we've been involved in dialogue with them, their concern, and, and I understand it, is the legislation, again, in the, the actual text of the criteria, it does call out labor rights as an issue, but unlike the uh, everything but arms with the GSP, the US legislation does not call out democracy or human rights specifically. All the US legislation says is not communist, which in 1974, was important, but communism today is a little less defined. Other point? Yeah. Yes, thank you. I think the, these are important. There are different views among the 
a Cambodian academic researcher or a politician that a way that should be called for sus suspension or cut the EBA or GSP. But I think the uh, EBA, GSP are very important for the Cambodian benefit for economic development. However, I think if the, uh, the, the, the ruling system are corrupt, and then the benefit from this, it seems not equally distributed to the people, but the, it empower uh, the, the people in the power the, uh, uh, through the corrupt uh, way. And, and one thing, and the other thing, I think the, uh, for another thing, the more the company benefit from uh, EBA and GSP opportunity, they are affiliated with the government of sure. And also, this company, more of them are, are owned by the foreign investors, especially Chinese. And they bring their expert, they bring their labor force uh, come, and so they benefit from this a lot. So, uh, and and also another thing, the I think the Hun San believe that the the violation of human rights and and, and uh, destroying the both the company has happened since long time, and he believe that international community doesn't do any task action except just compromising by believing in dialogue. And so this is the way that he believes, and he, he already go ahead with, with his own way. So when consider about the, the uh, Cambodian people benefit, I, I appreciate that to have the EBA and GSP Cambodia. But, but when we think that without democracy and human rights respect, that there is a big girl loose of Cambodian people. So it's better, it's time to consider this kind of action that I propose. Thank you. Thank you. Other, anybody else want to receive? Um, <clears throat> so I have a slightly different opinion. I think that while it's fine to go about reviewing Cambodia's eligibility for EBA and for GSP, mm -hmm. which is what is laid out in um, especially the Senate legislation, I think that that is fine to review it and obviously it's actually mandated by the requirements like whether or not they actually meet those requirements those are good reasons for revoking eba if cambodia no longer meets them and those are good reasons for revoking gsp what i don't think are good reasons would be to have almost like a politically motivated angle to this where it doesn't seem like cambodia is being evaluated on the basis of those standards because i think then countries will feel like these trade preferences are being offered in a politically motivated way, which I don't think is the intention of that. The second reason that I'm a little bit concerned about, about these issues is that I think that a more targeted approach, which holds the individuals who are directly responsible for undermining democracy, for undermining human rights in Cambodia accountable, should be the first priority. If you were to revoke GSP or EBA, you have the potential to severely harm the Cambodian people. And I think that the primary goal of US policy in Cambodia should be to create as much space as possible for the Cambodian's voices and the will of the Cambodian people to be achieved. I'm not sure that revoking GSP or EBA would fundamentally achieve that in the same way that the use of targeted financial measures would. So I would lean more toward a strategy that emphasizes- The Democracy Act did? Like the Cambodia Democracy Act. I'm not allowed to endorse legislation at Heritage, I just to be clear. It. I'm just saying, yeah. <laughs> more, Olivia, more of an example of what you're talking about, targeting exactly. those people that have been identified by the president. Yes, that's right. May I add, John. So again, I want to emphasize something I emphasized in my testimony, which is that the legislation to enhance targeted sanctions on individuals is great, but it's not necessary. The administration already has authorities to do that. Our preference um, is also to use targeted sanctions on senior CPP officials implicated in gross human rights abuses to affect change. And that's the point I wanted to make about to answer your question. The number one criterion for answering your questions is will it affect behavioral change? Right. You need to cause a cost to be incurred by the government that will make them reevaluate what they're doing and change their behavior. Will suspending GSP do that or EBA if you're in the shoes of Brussels? I think the answer in the end of the day is I don't know. We don't know. 
It's certainly the case that there are concerns that the cost would be passed on to the Cambodian workers and the Cambodian people. There's a counter argument that most companies, and maybe, maybe Mr. Mishrell as a businessman can answer this better than me, but many companies, when confronted with higher tariffs on goods, would pass that cost on to the Cambodian government by demanding that they lower other uh, costs and taxes that the Cambodian government incurs. So in other words, if you have a 20% increase in your tariff going into Europe or into the US, you then turn around to the Cambodian government and you say, you need to make me whole. You need to lower your transportation fees and your port costs and whatever else that you levy on us as we bring goods out of Cambodia. And that way, business goes on, the Cambodian workers aren't affected, but the Cambodian government has been hurt because now it's lost you know, these tax revenues. So, but I don't know, I'm not an economist. Right. I'm just saying maybe what you could do is ask the US Trade Representative or the Department of Commerce to do a study to figure out what, what, what's the bottom line on this. What would most retailers and buyers and investors do if they were confronted with GSP revocation? Thank you, anybody else wanna jump in? If I may, to your point, those exact items are in process. There's a complete strategy being developed in Cambodia. What happens if e primarily EBA goes away because that is the, the larger of the two? <coughs> yes, tariff or uh, port, uh, also holidays for workers. Those are there's six being el eliminated this year. So these these steps are being put in place. The I guess the the counter to the points that you both made, which are both good, is Congressman, you're, you face your constituency every two years. How important are jobs? Very important. And we are providing those jobs. And it, at Cambodia's level of development, if you think about it in terms of Maslow's theory of hierarchy, they're operating at the food shelter, you know, the basics. They're not up to a point of where they're looking for Jeffersonian democracy, they are really operating at a level where <clears throat> as long as they're a little bit better than they were last year, they'll continue to put up with this. And that's, that's what my primary concern is. Another concern that you, know, you hear around here has been in the, uh, and realistically so, I'm not saying it's just that you're here around here, but it's a concern, is um, in Southeast Asia especially, and all th the role of, the, of China. Where is China in, in, uh, in this? And I'm wondering about you, maybe a couple of questions. One is, uh, in your experience, uh, are we losing the leverage that we had? Is there, are the Chinese having greater leverage in terms of what is happening in Cambodia than we have? Is that real or is that just a perception that we have that, that uh, the, the, while there's tremendous, uh, the, you know, what I s feel or I s around, you know, when I speak to people is that while the Cambodian people strongly like the United States, as far as influence in the government, we are losing influence because of the role of China. And I'm just wondering, you're on this, do you feel that at all also? Do you see that? Yes? That's a good question. That is, that, and that's one of the reasons we're asking, you know, uh, what is, you know, uh, uh, our, our role vis-a-vis -vis China and uh, are you seeing yourselves, I missed if any of you had talked about that in your presentation, regarding labor rights or human rights or just, uh, uh, as they become, as there are, uh, it is, Although Cambodia certainly has publicly expressed it does not want any Chinese naval station in Cambodia, they've said that, but yet we have the perception that they are moving closer to, towards China. And I'm just wondering whether, wh is that, how do we, any thoughts about that and how should we be dealing with some of those issues? Olivia. 
Yeah, so I did address it in my testimony as one of the main arguments for actually engaging on democracy and human rights issues. I think there are a number of reasons to be concerned about Cambodia turning toward China more heavily, especially the reports of the naval base. But I don't think that these are reasons for us to not continue to press for human rights and democracy issues. And I think that there are reasons why um, the Cambodian government, but also the Cambodian people, may look to China and think that they're not a reliable partner. One would be the way in which China has engaged through the Belt and Road Initiative, where they have acted not in an altruistic manner, but focused very much so on enriching themselves, creating ongoing contracts for them, bringing in Chinese workers rather than bringing in economic benefits for the individual Cambodians inside. Um, And this is not just in Cambodia. This is all over the world. And I think beyond that, there are really concerning trends where China is deploying their surveillance technology in some cases to even... um, act in ways where they're collecting for espionage purposes and spying purposes data from other governments. Um, We saw this in the case of the African Union where they built the African Union building and every night they were receiving nightly downloads from their servers from 2012 to 2017. These are concerning um, infringements that affect not only the fundamental freedoms and privacy of average Cambodians, but also the interests of the Cambodian government who may not want China to know everything that they're up to. But I think beyond this, um, there are interests that Cambodia has with the U.S. that uh, are not affected by whether or not they choose. I don't think countries in in Southeast Asia in particular like to be asked whether to choose between uh, working with China or working with the U.S. The reality is that countries in Southeast Asia are going to engage with both countries. But I think that there are interests that Cambodia has in particular, whether it's through security guarantees or access to U.S. markets, for example, um, that I think out, at the end of the day outweigh any decision that would cause them to go, say, solely over to China. And that is, again, one of the reasons why I think we shouldn't revoke GSP. Because if we were to revoke GSP, we remove the positive benefits that we're able to give to ordinary Cambodians. And I think that that's pretty challenging and may actually sacrifice some of the goodwill that, as you so aptly referenced, we do enjoy at present from the Cambodian people. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, yes, so you just add to what Olivia just mentioned. The, I think the, the what uh, Chinese influence of uh, present in Cambodia is, is not just about the uh, Chinese interest or geography or, uh, or the concern, our concern over the uh, security, uh, regional or uh, uh, world security. But the, uh, one of the points I want to, to uh, draw the attention is the, it also maybe it, it become the model of changing from, for example, like a ruling system uh, from the uh, uh, democratic system to a, ru- a Chinese ruling system leadership style that 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 it, it becoming in into uh, becoming a propaganda of the company and government uh, uh, to the company and people right now and also I, I think the uh, beside this benefit uh, China also use company to control the uh, the international uh, uh, political agenda uh, where the company can express on behalf of the China for example like the Asian uh, forum or the other international uh, uh, event or forum that the uh, uh, company uh, government already uh, 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 say or speak on behalf of China, that that uh, something that we should consider also. But the um, among the other thing, the right now if we look at the people perception, the company people they like U.S. they call for the U.S. to uh, make intervention to support and they. I expect to see democracy that uh, uh, which will be supported by U.S. and, and the other pa- uh, international community partner. But uh, from time to time, the uh, government trying to brainwash Cambodian people, don't believe in U.S., don't believe in the Western uh, democratic style, and uh, just believe in what uh, you need to eat every day. And this, this kind of message that they, they bring in, they see, Chinese bring a lot of money in, bring a lot of development in. So I think if this going on uh, 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 from time to time, long as long, and then maybe people see, okay, 
this is right. What the government said is right. So people will lose confidence in, in, the, in the Western style democracy or in the democracy perception. They become believe in development and they don't care what kind of development. That, that's kind of thing and that I, I want to draw the attention. Thank you. Yes. Um, maybe it's quite limited for me to, to give a full answer, but I just give um, my observation. Um, yes. I, China, and I accept that and I yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, seeing China present in, in, in the country, I observe uh, there are some blockage in the ASEAN mechanisms. For example, in 2012, uh, while Cambodia uh, chaired the ASEAN summit, Mm -hmm. And then uh, at the end of the summit, uh, the ASEAN cannot issue a joint position on the South China Sea. Uh, and also yeah. it happened in other uh, ASEAN summit in uh, ASEAN and Australia. Uh, also, um, Cambodian uh, opposed to the joint position of ASEAN, uh, Cambodian opposed to the joint uh, uh, position of, of ASEAN. Uh, on the South China Seas and the other ASEAN uh, agenda. So we see the, the, the increase of blocking the ASEAN mechanism. And <coughs> we see also the decrease of uh, uh, respect of human rights, democracies also uh, 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 being uh, weakened in the country. Um, at the same time, uh, but I can say, I mean, even China's coming to Cambodia, just like in the public, they show that they, they, they are bringing the investment to the country. Uh, but Cambodia, both Cambodia and China, based on the export data in 2018, Cambodia still depend on the European market and US market. Yeah. And the whole economic landscape of Cambodia, textile, footwear, uh, are the backbone of the economy, of the national economy. And the, the main market for Cambodia uh, is European market and US market. And the four country, the, the four top country that um, Cambodia export, number one is Europe market, number two is US, number three is UK, and number four is Japan. And the four country that Cambodia import, the number one is China. China is 40%, uh, while European uh, market where, where we export to, it's just only uh, 29%. Um, and then number two country that Cambodian uh, import is Thailand, number three, Vietnam, number four, Japan. So if we compare among the four, uh, the four top country ex export for Cambodia and the four country export import for Cambodia, only Japan is the, the one that we, we, we see the fair trade exchange. Thank you. John. Um, I deal with this argument on a host of countries I work on, Burma, Thailand. Um, you know, the argument is if you push the government too hard, they will go into the arms of the Chinese government. And I, with Cambodia more than any other country, the answer is essentially, look, they're already in the hands of the Chinese government. Not completely, but they have already gotten extraordinarily close. And it is best illustrated by the point you just raised about how they have delivered a veto in ASEAN repeatedly on the South China Seas. This is beyond our mandate as a human rights group. I'm just observing as a political observer, the Chinese government has essentially got in Hun Sen a puppet at ASEAN, a person who will disrupt you know, ASEAN consensus on something. So they're already in the hands of the Chinese government in that realm. But that's not to say they couldn't go farther into the arms of the Chinese. The reason I think that's not likely is because of the growing anti-Chinese sentiment that you see across Cambodia right now. From Sinekville to the north, Massive BRI projects, building hotels, building hydroelectric dams, land concessions for rubber plantations. A lot of those companies that have those concessions and those businesses are Chinese companies. I was just up in the north. A hydroelectric dam was built that displaced um, thousands of people and affected the livelihoods of tens of thousands more. People are angry. 
they're angry and they know that it's because China and Chinese companies have essentially been given free reign to do destructive business development projects across the country. And although they're brutal and abusive, I don't think the CPP is stupid. And they're going to recognize one day that being too close to China is actually dangerous politically to them. That if they are seen as essentially a China vassal state, it's ultimately going to lead uh, the people of Cambodia to build up a resentment that is actually dangerous to CPP rule. So I say go ahead and push them because they know that they can't go much farther into the arms of the Chinese. They've already gone too far. One last question. If we were now five years or six years later than we are now, let's say it's after the next round of elections, are we going to ever see free and fair elections again in the country? No? Everybody agree? We, we, Cambodia is not going to move toward. Well, if you isolated the government and made them a pariah state and had targeted economic sanctions at the EU level, the US level, right. Australia, Canada, all imposing targeted economic sanctions on the top CPP leadership, I could imagine a scenario where plausibly the CPP would say, we took it too far, we have to let the opposition compete, let's let Sam Rainsy back into the country, let's let the media flourish again. We let it happen for 20 years and we got away with it. And, and basically, go back to where they were pre-2013 when they when sort they of- When they had a media. Sort of, yeah. Public and when they, when they I'm not saying that's full and free and fair and wonderful. This I'm just saying it's better than what you're not, you're not predicting this, but you're seeing this as a possibility. I would reiterate what John said, but I would say also there's a real need to revisit assistance to Cambodia, in particular the democracy promotion assistance that we've given. Not necessarily that it needs to be taken away, but that it needs to be reevaluated for how it can be used most effectively to create space within civil society for individual Cambodians to have a voice. In a scenario where Hun Sen feels emboldened to go after the media, emboldened to go after anti-trafficking groups, labor groups, a, a whole host of groups. I think it's pretty impossible, even in an isolated scenario, if, they, if the Cambodian people don't feel in some way supported, I think it's pretty impossible that you would see the reemergence of a healthy civil society there, especially with the opposition being incapable of functioning. Yes, in the back. We're going to kind of come to a conclusion. It will not happen. And that's a different time. That was a time, you know, that was not, you know, Hun Sen had not developed the infrastructure and the, and the power that he has. So that, so that is different. Is there anything that you would like to add? I want to bring this to a, that for me to hear, maybe in just a sen couple of sentences, it's really important for me to convey this back to my colleagues in the, Congress, what, what one or two sentences would you say you'd like me to hear? I've heard now pretty clearly that look again at what where uh, the kinds of interventions that we want and that maybe trade privileges might not target the very people that we want to target is what I'm saying. That I'm not saying I always agree with that, but I hear you saying that and that you know, that may hurt the Cambodian people more than the government and others, and that targeted sanctions to those that are engaging in the bad behavior, visa restrictions and things like that, might be more effective is what I'm hearing you saying and bring about change faster. Although I'm not hearing from any of you that change is gonna come real fast, <laughs> no matter what we do. So I'm just wondering, what would you like me to leave with me now? Yes. They wait for America?
Just the stick, it has to come from the United States. Yes, Dan. Thank you, Congressman. I, I would like to take uh, this opportunity to thank you in person to that, uh, you and uh, Congressman Steve Chabot uh, sponsored the BLHR 526 and, and the House passed uh, the bill. But the, I, I think the uh, uh, Cambodian people, I think the more and more Cambodian people are eager to change. And it, it is uh, witnessed with what happened in two th late 2017 when the, the CPP dissolved the CNP because they don't want to have the uh, strong competitor. And, 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 and that's clear uh, uh, evidence that we, we see. So, but uh, right now, I think the uh, Cambodian people yeah, need uh, to wait for the opportunity, who can lead them uh, uh, to fight for democracy. And, but what I said is that the, they, they need a strong opposition, work in strategic way with a strategic plan, with clear plan, and in the united way. But uh, right now, I think the, we also face problem because the opposition is, is at the uh, uh, fragile, uh, among uh, themselves, I think, I think this is at the point that uh, we need to push and convince the uh, opposition to become together and, and, and to think about the plan and uh, 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 strategic way how to uh, fight for democracy and humanity in Cambodia. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Okay, anybody else want anything? Yeah, Daniel. I don't think we can ignore the genuine security interest that the U.S. has that if these bases, if that airstrip that's two miles long in the middle of nowhere actually become operational, uh, those, are, those are very real material risk. Uh, we've had a brigadier general put his name on that intelligence. They can deny it all they want, but I, I joined the Army when I was 17, so if a brigadier general puts his name on it, I kind of... I give that more credibility than any denial out of Cambodia. You're real concerned about that. Yeah, John. Two things. You asked them what can you bring back to your colleagues. Right. And one thing I've encountered in my years of advocacy in Washington is that there are a lot of members of Congress, both Democrats and Republicans, who are skeptical of targeted sanctions. They're skeptical of sanctions, right. but even targeted sanctions. Um, because there's a sort of general sense, because of past mistakes that even targeted sanctions can impose a cost on to ordinary people. Um, I just think it's really important to emphasize that the kinds of sanctions that we're talking about, the global Magnitsky type of sanctions, are not going to impose heavy costs on the ordinary people of Cambodia. They're going to impose costs on the leadership of Cambodia. And I, so it's just important that both Democrats and Republicans who are skeptical, who say to you as a colleague, well, I'm skeptical because you know I don't think that sanctions are the right way to go. In this case, this is the kind of thing that would lead the CPP to change their mind. So you know, we I I just would urge you to push back on that. And then the other thing is, as not so much with your colleagues here, but just to be aware that one of the things that's driving U.S. policy way too much is that the Pacific Command out in Honolulu is very keen to have closer ties with the Cambodian military, and the Thai military, and many others. And unfortunately, I feel like all too often they um, are getting their way, and that the National Security Council and the State Department is not doing enough to guide the military doctrine out there that's being essentially run out of Honolulu. And so there, there needs to be more oversight by the Senate Armed Services Committee, the House Armed Services Committee, and by all the committees that are interested in the foreign policy as it pertains to Cambodia. Because we can't just let 
Pacific Command, Indo-Pacific Command decide to have close relationships with an abusive military uh, without there being you know, some pushback of what the policy is. Or at least if you're going to have a closer relationship, get something for it, put a price tag on it. So that's, what, oh, that's just what I want to say. Yeah, now let me just mention Olivia and then a few others and then we'll finish. Olivia. I just have one sentence. I think U.S. interests are best advanced in a Cambodia that is democratic and not authoritarian. I think that should be the theme. U.S. Interests are, US best, interests advanced. are best advanced in a democratic Cambodia rather than an authoritarian one. I agree with you, but I just asked, is there going to be a democratic Cambodia? And everybody said no. Yeah. <laughs> Jessica. I just want to echo Tola's point that, you know, U.S. companies and U.S. consumers are a key market for right, Cambodia. Market. And that when what we have seen um, over the past year, I think, around labor rights abuses is that when there's an economic voice that's raised, you know, when U.S. companies have spoken out, that we've seen some willingness to shift on some of the worst problems. And so I, I think that having USTR engage more deeply on freedom of association, encouraging U.S. companies to engage more deeply on freedom of associ association could be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to try to bring it to a close, but Tula. Thank you again. Um, actually, uh, for me, I can see that people are waiting anxiously for the real election. For the what? The real election. For the real election. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying uh, free and fair election, but people are anxiously waiting for the real election. The real. Uh, yeah. We, we, can, we can look at the election history of Cambodia, in n uh, the first one in 1993. Uh, the number of turnout is, is also high. And then um, uh, in 2013, the number of, uh, uh, of the voter turnout is also high. And it is the, the only one history in the country in 2017 uh, for the communal election, the sub-national election. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it is the first time that the number of turnout is very, very high. So the sentiment of the people uh, show clearly that they, they, they really want uh, to express their opinion to change the leadership or to change the country or whatever. Right. Uh, but uh, the number of turnout is going down after uh, 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 in, 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 in 2018. There was uh, no election, there was no party. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but so we really need a real election to be happening. Uh, and I strongly believe that the ec economic leverage is still effective to make the rehab change. Well, uh, I, I think we're trying to think the same thing yeah. and trying to figure out what is that best leverage. I think you, you, you raise a very good point. I mean, yeah. how can we promote labor rights and democracy and 
public opinion and, and free elections. And I think economically we can put leverage on them, whether it's through sanctions. But I think that ultimately the people are supposedly going to have to step up and you know, yeah. decide what they want. And uh, I'm not clear yet. I agree with you. I think that people were ready for a change. I think that the prime minister saw that and realized that this was a very dangerous time for the – regardless of what he had done, good or bad, the people were beginning to express their opinions, and their opinions were – such that it might be time for change, and I think that really frightened the government. So I don't know where we are now. We're trying to figure out, as we say, mm -hmm. trade privileges or sanctions. How, how, wh what is that best leverage? Who? How do we impact the government and not hurt the people? It's a very, mm -hmm. very critical question. But I think that at the end of the day, uh, Oh, and that's why it's so important, uh, hopefully, to see the media come back, some public discourse back out there. It's going to be uh, – we can help, but it's really going to be up to the people also mm. to want you know, to take back their country. And I'm not sure when you're so poor and other countries like China come in and, and provide jobs and money that people are going to be ready to take that on. I Somebody was talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Cambodia is still pretty far down on the hierarchy in terms of people are just still dealing with basic needs, and we have to appreciate that. But we're here to say we want to support labor rights. We want to support democracy, and we're not quite sure, or I'm not quite sure, I can't say we, what's the best way to accomplish this. I see this slipping away in Cambodia, I worry a lot. I thought that there was a real opportunity after the changes in 2013, that change was on the way. Uh, maybe we got too complacent. I thought I, it's going to happen, uh, but it didn't. And just the opposite happened. Uh, doesn't mean we're always going to be stuck in where we are now. But that's why we're having this. What is the best? What are the next steps that we need? And how can we encourage and support those efforts for change? We can't do it alone. It's not going to be. But we have to be a player there also. I also really believe not in the United States of America. Move away from Asia. That would be a big mistake for us to do. So I want to thank everybody. I don't know if you resolved anything, but it cer certainly was helpful, and I really appreciate it. And I just want to end and, and thank you again and um, for putting up with my crazy schedule. And um, this uh, session of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, we're going to draw to a close now. Thank you all. All right, I need to call, talk to Keith. Let me call him right now.